So when you look at happiness studies, uh, I think there's the one happiness study that this article that I read today refers to. Oh, by the way, do you guys know I have a newsletter now? If you sign up for the newsletter, you can, you can sign up for the newsletter on youronbookshow.com. Youronbookshow.com, you can get a newsletter. And the newsletter would have links to a lot of these articles. Uh, the newsletter comes out once a week with links to articles, links to Ayn Rand lectures, Leonard Peikoff material, uh, just stuff that I think you'll find interesting. Um, so uh, another way to engage with me, with the show, me with you. So go sign up for the newsletter, youronbookshow.com. Um, all right, so this is the World Happiness Report. The World Happiness Report has Finland of all countries, Finland, a country I've been to twice, coming out number one as the happiest place on earth. Number two, and by the way, it's been there four years in a row. Number two, right, is Iceland, which I've also been to, but only once. And number three is Denmark. My guess is that Sweden and Norway are not that far behind. I don't know. But generally, Scandinavia is considered this model. Now, so there's been a lot of buzz around why are they so happy? What makes Scandinavians so happy? So first, there was this idea that... Um, called, I think it's Heige or something like that, Heige, uh, which is like a Scandinavian concept of being comfortable, convenient, and, and, and having things cozy, and, you know, this culture of everything kind of small and cozy and friendly and nice and I don't know, something. And there were books written about this and self-help stuff, and it's out of fashion now because it turned out it didn't make anybody happy. Um, but generally, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Scandinavian countries are Heige, yes, H-Y-G-G-E. Right? That's the, 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 the thing that makes D Danish happy. It turns out, nah, studies have looked at it. People have tried it in other countries, didn't make them happy. So now everybody's asking, what makes Finland so wonderful? Well... So they look at this, you know, you know, there's a Finnish, according to this article. So this is an article in Slate, in Slate. Now, Slate is something I don't think you guys even read. So this is the beauty of you listening to your own book show, because you get, get the good stuff from Slate, not the garbage. Um, so according to this article, written by a Finnish woman, the Finnish spiritual equivalency of Haig is called Kalsawikanit. <laughs> I need Anu from the Ayn Rand Institute to, to, to pronounce it. Kalsawikanit. I have no idea what that means. Uh, how do you pronounce this thing? Anyway, K-A-L-S-A-R-I-K-A-N-N-I-T. And this translates as pants drunk. Pants drunk. Which refers to the practice a binge drinking, home alone, in your underpants. <laughs> now, that cannot be, I mean, and I say this seriously, that cannot be the secret to a happy life. And yet, this is what the Finns are known for. Getting drunk at home, alone, naked, or in your underpants. Now, Finland has a reputation for being quite amazing in many respects, right? Uh, Finland supposedly has the best educational system. Uh, I'm skeptical. And so are the Finns, by the way. They have the lowest levels of corruption. That's probably true. Scandinavian countries generally, Finland in particular, probably have very low levels, maybe the lowest level of corruption. They have the most sustainable economy. Eh, what does that even mean? And they've got all kinds of other stuff that they're supposed to be really, really, really good at that is probably, they're probably not that good at. Yeah, I think uh, skiing and shooting, they're very good at skiing and then shooting in the Winter Olympics. So, uh, you know, when I, 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 even the Finns don't really believe the story about them being the happiest people on the planet. So when a cabinet member of the Finnish government was once introduced 
at an international conference as, quote, the representative of the happiest country in the world, his response was, quote, if that's true, I'd hate to see the other nations. Right. Now, this whole idea of the Finns being happy is pretty ridiculous. How do they measure happiness? And, and, and first, if you go to Finland, they were brooding, they never smile, they're not very emotive, they're not very expressive, they're shy and depressed, and they're pretty proud of it. So how can they be the happiest people in the world? Well, let's look at the methodology of the World Happiness Report. So this is what the host World Happiness Report, it doesn't ask them about being happy because that's a biased question. You don't ask people, are you happy? You try, to, you try to tease happiness out of their other answers. And here, the key is one question, a question they take from Gallup. And this is the question. So let's say there's a ladder with 10 steps, numbered zero to 10. The top rung 10 represents the best possible life for you, while the bottom rung, zero, represents the worst life for you. The survey participants are then asked to report the number that corresponds to the rung on which they are currently standing. So do you think you're in the worst kind of world condition or the best possible to you. Scandinavians report being close to the best. That's where they are today. And that is deemed happiness. Happiness is if your actual life circumstances approximate your highest expectations. But there's, of course, a major flaw here, right? A major flaw. Doesn't that depend on your expectations? And is that indeed a representation of happiness? Is happiness about expectations and meeting them? Any expectations, no matter what they are? Now, Scandinavia, what happens in Scandinavia is that people expect to live what I have called a normal life. You remember that philosopher that I uh, critiqued a few shows back that said, why is a normal life not good enough anymore? Well, in Scandinavia, it is. People's highest expectation is to live a normal, mediocre, boring uneventful, unambitious life. And they achieve that. The Scandinavian welfare state makes sure that very few people live in poverty or are homeless or that have some kind of material deprivation. The, those levels are about as low as you can get in Scandinavia. People have access to education, they have access to health care. It's about as good as you can get. You know, not as good as the best, but as good, it's kind of as good as the West outside the United States office. They take long vacations. They have long paternal leave. They have an easy life. They have a comfortable life. They have a life with little risk. But the flip side of that is that they have little ambition. They have a little passion. That's why they're so emotional less. They've lived in 
little striving. So as good Lutherans, they accept their fate. They have terrible buying power. They have a high cost of living. They live in small apartments. Their standard of living is relatively low as compared to most American states on average, certainly as compared to the middle class and upper middle class in the United States. They're not happy. They just don't have expectations. Indeed, the mentality of Scandinavians is often captured in what's called the law of the jante, J-A-N-T-E. And I'm butchering all these names, and I apologize. These are a set of commandments believed to capture something essential about the Nordic disposition of personal success. I've heard this from many Scandinavians, right? Quote, you're not to think you're anything special. You're not to imagine yourself better than you are, than we are. You're not to think you're good at anything. Don't dare drive a nice car. Don't dare have a nice home. Don't stand out relative to anybody else. Don't be too ambitious. So... They're the exact opposite in many respects of the best of American culture. They're not ambitious. They don't strive for more. They don't try to excel. They don't want more, 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 bigger, bigger, bigger. They don't want to be successful. They want to fit in. I'll just respond to this. Yuan isn't a Finn. Why does he think he knows better for them? Because I'm a human being. And I know better for human beings. And the principles for happiness are universal. They're not Finnish or American. I mean, this is exactly the kind of uh, nativism and collectivism that I oppose, that Ayn Rand opposed, that you should oppose. The principles for happiness, the principles for success, the principles for what beings are universal. They're not based on your genes. They're not even based on your culture. They are bad cultures. And Finnish culture is not that good. Scandinavians are not religious, but they're influenced by religious, by religion. They're influenced by religion. A globalist is an anti-concept. There is no such thing as a globalist. They're very, there's no definition of it that makes any sense. Um, it's there to destroy universality, which is what I just described. It's, it's a concept to destroy globalization, which means free trade. It's there to destroy positive concepts. For the Finns, Finnish culture is bad for Finns. Just like the culture of the Soviet Union was bad for the people who lived in the Soviet Union. And you can make those evaluations. The culture in Rwanda is bad for Rwandans or for any human being. They are universal principles that guide how human beings should, as individuals, live. And when you construct, when there are lots of individuals in a space, that ultimately will create a culture. So Nordic countries give their citizens, provide their citizens. Islam is bad for Muslims. Very good. Absolutely. Uh, Nordic countries provide decent lives for their citizens. You know, again, they cap the downside. Um, you know, one of, one of the, my tests, by the way, for uh, whether uh, uh, Swedish culture is good for Swedes and Finnish culture is good for Finns relative to American culture is my my test that I, I encourage everybody, I encourage the world to try one of these days. Let's say we had complete open immigration between the United States, Finland, Sweden. Where do you think, where do you think the movement would be? 
Would it be Americans going to Finland in order to try their wonderful culture? Or would it be massive numbers of Finns and Swedes, the most ambitious, the most entrepreneurial, the most individualistic coming to the United States? I have no doubt which direction the flow would go. No doubt. You see it today. In spite of all the barriers we put up, there are more Swedish immigrants in the United States than American immigrants in Sweden. Swedes, uh, I mean Finns, uh, believe that they, what they have is as good as it gets. It's good enough. It's good enough. Why want more? And they're happy to live, or not happy, I'd say content to live mediocre, simple, normal lives. And as you know from Iran's rules for living, don't be normal. I haven't got to that war yet, but we're going to get to that war. Try to be exceptional. Not relative to other people, but relative to what you are, can achieve, what is possible to you. Strive for the exceptional. Strive for the beautiful. Strive for the amazing, for the best that you can be. Don't settle for a McMansion when you can buy a beautiful modern home overlooking the mountains. Finns are settling for small apartments, settling for owning modest incomes, a settling for having very limited purchasing power, a settling for high prices and high taxes. And then, of course, they settling for living where it's freezing. God, the coldest I've ever been was in Finland. Um, it, it, it was biting cold. I mean, I've been in places where the temperature was lower, but I've never felt so cold in my life. Maybe I wasn't wearing enough clothes. I don't know. But it was, it was, it was uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit, minus 23, 24 centigrades, I think, or more. Uh, but zero degrees Fahrenheit, and it was so cold. Um, I, I thought I'd walk around Helsinki because I'd never been there before, and I lasted 10 minutes outdoors, 10 minutes. The fact that people are satisfied with what they have doesn't mean it's good for them. And if they're socialized to be generally satisfied with stuff, then they're satisfied. Americans and Israelis are never satisfied. It's what makes them entrepreneurial. It's what makes them ambitious. And I think at the end of the day, what makes them happier. If they could get rid of the guilt that their cultures inflict on them. So none of this is what happiness is. Happiness is not being content. Happiness is not settling. Happiness is not just ach achieving um, the best you can expect when your expectations are low. Happiness is a state of consciousness. It is an emotional state of contentment with the world, of achieving one's values, of knowing that one has lived, lived with a capital L to the one's fullest potential of having been ambitious, not just ambitious about any particular material thing, but ambitious about life, ambitious about success, ambitious about success in living. Happiness is a state of flourishing as a human being. It's a state of fulfillment. It's not a state of normalcy, of settling, of being like everybody else, of accepting one's fate. It is a state of taking one's fate in one's own hands and shaping the world according to it. Happiness is not just being okay. But that's what happiness studies measure. They measure contentment. They measure lack of stress. They measure lack of risk. But stress and risk 
are not bad things. They actually can be positives. They spur growth. They define new boundaries. My quest is not the ethics, the standards for happiness, the standards for human flourishing are not Finnish or Swedish or Americanish or Israelish. They're human. They're human. There is right for all humans. There is goodness for all humans. There is justice that is universal. Ruth asks, Scandinavians seem to cope well with their unhappiness. Does it matter if one lives a normal life as long as it does not threaten survival? Yes, it matters because, yes, they cope with it. But it's a question of what kind of life do you want to live? Do you want to live a life where you just cope with unhappiness? Or do you want to live a happy life? A fulfilled, flourishing life? An exciting, thrilling life? I think the Finns are not living. Not fully. And that's why the best Finns do what? The best Finns leave Finland. The best Finns leave Finland. And this article that I read you from, and I read quite a bit from it, was written by a Finn who's left Finland. And this is what she writes. So this is somebody from Finland, she writes. But is this really what we mean by happiness? Okay. If it is, maybe American parents should stop encouraging their kids to aim so high and suggest more realistic goals. Quote, one day, sweet Riley, you too can be president of the Homeowners Association, unquote. I'm not sure I agree. If that's happiness, count me out. My definition of happiness includes joy, love, and meaningful engagement with people around me. The reason why I decided to stay here in the United States, despite a couple of efforts to return to Finland, is because I like it when people smile laugh, and yes, even talk to their neighbors. It makes me happy. Now, I think she's got happiness wrong too, right? Because I think, yes, smiling, joy, love, where's productive work here, where's ambition, where's all the rest? But okay, but at least she gets it that settling, being dull, being boring, being gray, being antisocial, drinking alone, is not happiness. It's not happiness. It's not human. It's sad. It really is a little pathetic. All right, let's see if we... I am to begin with. I wonder if I can ask you to capsulize. I know this is difficult. Can I ask you to capsulize your philosophy? What uh, is Randism? Uh, First of all, I do not call it Randism, and I don't like that name. All I right. call it Objectivism. All right. Meaning a philosophy based on objective reality. Now, let me explain it as briefly as I can. First, my philosophy is based on the concept that reality exists as an objective absolute. That man's mind, reason, is his means of perceiving it and that man needs a rational morality. I am primarily the creator of a new code of morality which has so far been believed impossible, namely, a morality not based on faith. On or faith. Not on faith, not on arbitrary whim, not on emotion, not on arbitrary edict, mystical or social, but on reason, a morality which can be proved by means of logic which can be demonstrated to be true and necessary. All right, all right. Now, may I define what my morality is? All right. Because this is merely an introduction. My morality is based on man's life as a standard of value. And since man's mind is his basic means of survival, I hold that if man wants to live on Earth and to live as a human being, 
he has to hold reason as an absolute, by which I mean that he has to hold reason as his only guide to action, and that he must live by the independent judgment of his own mind, that his highest moral purpose is the achievement of his own happiness, and that he must not force other people, nor accept their right to force him, that each man must live as an end in himself and follow his own rational self-interest. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes but uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support, or on Patreon, or Subscribestar, or Locals, uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value, hopefully, you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.